So I'd like to introduce to you our moderator, um, Ila Norbosh, who is, um, I think, one of my favorite maker, creator people in the world. Um, when I first met him, he just sort of like blew my mind. Mother, I met your mother at the same time. Who's like, I know why you are the way you are. <laughs> as soon as I met her. Um, Ila is the director of the Create Lab um, at Carnegie Mellon, which stands for Community Robotics Education and Technology Empowerment which really sums up what he does um, with his work. Um, we also have on the panel Colleen Lewis. Colleen is an assistant professor of CS at Harvey, Met, Harvey Mudd. Um, and she is, uh, her focus is research on gender and diversity issues in CS education and how programming environments shape perception, learning, and goals. And she's going to tell you a little bit about also what she does for NSF, too, which is as a teacher tip trainer. CS teaching tips. Teacher, te CS teacher trips. If you've been on that website, that's her. She's responsible for that. Um, and uh, also I'd like to introduce next um, Paolo Blickstein, who's with Stanford University, who's an assistant professor in Transformative Learning Technologies Lab, focusing on how new tech can deeply transform the learning of STEM. And Patricia Ordonez, who came all the way from Puerto Rico to be with us. Um, and she is a assistant professor in the CS faculty at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. And her focus is on health information, infor, informatica, informatics, informatics. I wrote that, I was, I was doing my Spanish, <laughs> poor Spanish. Um, and she was a high school math teacher and Spanish teacher before she began pursuing a, a PhD in computer science. So, Ila, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Whitney. Well, we have a small audience, so we're going to make this an intimate and interactive session. So please pull forward if you can and prepare yourselves to ask questions. The format we're going to use is uh, we've asked each of our speakers to give you about five or ten minutes, just giving you a sense of one of the things that they care about the most that fits the theme of experiential learning, project-based learning, inclusiveness, and such like. So we're going to start with each of them speaking for a few minutes without questions. Once they've all done that, I'll take notes furiously and ask a sort of uh, facilitating question to begin with from each. And once we've done that, I'm going to turn it over to you. And hopefully we can have a discussion as a group of peers in the room. So again, thank you to the speakers for joining us today. Thank you all for picking this amongst your four parallel tracks that you could have chosen from. You chose the right one, so good job. <laughs> You've passed the first test. Um, and let me start with uh, Colleen. Go ahead. Howdy. I'm Colleen. Oh. Um, maybe I have to be kind of quiet so that we don't distract them. Is that true? Um, okay, whatever. Great. I'm Colleen. Um, I'm a computer science professor at Harvey Mudd uh, College, and I research how people learn computer science and how people feel about learning computer science, sort of at the sixth grade level and college students. Um, I've got this project, csteachingtips.org. Maybe some of you have seen it before. There are stickers and pens over there on the suitcase display rack um, and tips for teaching computer science. I'm probably going to say that like six more times. It's my stick. There's stickers and pens over on the table. Okay. But the, this piece of experiential learning, I want to start and talk about um, you know, a tip that we use at Harvey Mudd. Um, as context, Harvey Mudd has a bunch of women studying computer science. In about 2006, it was about 10% women. Um, and now we're hovering between 40 and 50% women majors. Um, and we're just going strong. I joined in 2012, so a lot of times people give me credit for making this transformation, and I was not there. I'm just, I joined the faculty, and I'm like, let's try to not mess this up. But my research area is education and equity and access, and so uh, I hope I'm bringing something to the table there. So I want to talk about one thing that we do in homework assignments, which is at the end of a homework assignment, We've made students do a bunch of problems, like do this, write this, do this tricky thing, learn this. At the end, we say, with the skills you've learned from this homework assignment, here's all that you could accomplish. And we sketch out possible open-ended projects that they could do. And then we give them like two or three extra credit points if they choose to do it. And so it, it doesn't disrupt the grading balance by giving them a few points. It, even if students don't do it, it allows them to see how what they've learned in more prescriptive exercises can open a door to some open-ended projects, um, and, and uh, I think and I think helps makes explicit what they've really learned to do. You know, one of the things that we 
that I hear a lot about the Harvey Mudd approach of like, we, we did a bunch of stuff to try and increase the percentage of women in computer science. One of the things I hear is like, oh, did you like water down the curriculum or make everything pink? Or like, what was that about? <clears throat> and, and in terms of the curriculum side and experiential learning, one of the things we did, and I, I'm happy to talk more about the other things we've done, um, is have that intro course be breadth. It's not about you know women and, and no men like social relevance. No, plenty of people of all different identities like social relevance. And it's not that men like assembly and women don't like assembly. No, plenty of people of all shapes, of all identities like these things. So the, the idea is in that intro course, we show the breadth of computer science to be like, oh, you might hate parts of this. And that's chill, because computer science is a super broad field. And as long as you like some of the weeks of the curriculum, there's a home for you in computer science. And so it's this idea of not providing like pink curriculum, but assuming that our students have a multiplicity of interests and motivations and goals um, and, and embedding that in authentic ways because let's not lie, computer science is a super broad field. Like whatever you want to do, I can tell you how it's actually just computer science. Okay, well, uh, first, thanks for the invitation and uh, being here this morning at 8 uh, a.m. You know, uh, also, I had a bike accident yesterday, so that's why I look. I have something in my eye. It was unfortunate, not like a fight or some interesting story to tell. Uh, so, yeah, I was, I was fighting with a, a bot. And, uh, so, uh, I, I want to talk about hands-on learning in the context of uh, social justice and especially I mean you know about all you know, the movement around maker spaces and, and how that's becoming mainstream in lots of schools so I think I want to talk about some counterintuitive things that I've observed over you know the next several years okay that's better uh, so you know, some of the interesting and also dangerous thing that I've observed over the last uh, you know few years um, around this this area so um, so there are like I think three important principles uh, around hands-on learning and maker spaces and maker activities in schools that I want you to start with uh, so I'm just timing here to make sure I don't go too much uh, go too long but I think the first principle is um, what, what I call the keychain principle. So uh, digital fabrication and 3D printers and laser cutters and all of that, they have this property of producing very cool objects, often with very little effort. So it's very easy to download from the web a little object on Thingiverse or whatever, or on lots of websites with 3D objects. So you download the object, you hit print, and you have like a beautiful keychain or a beautiful like you know, figurine, Star Wars thing and all of that. And that's very satisfying for, if, you, if you've never done that, it's also very cool to, you know, talk to your friends or your parents, say, hey, I did this at school and all of that. So it's, it's sort of a local minimum. Like everybody is happy by printing the Star Wars things or making keychains and all of that. But no one is really doing any, you know, significant intellectual work. And so that's the key keychain syndrome, uh, which is, it's, it's too easy to get impressive objects. And a lot of times schools and museums and after school programs, they get stuck in this place where kids are just doing very trivial objects. Everybody's happy because the objects are cool, but you, know, you, you, don't, go, uh, you, you don't go past that. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, this idea of process before product. Right. So when you go to the Maker Fair, for example, uh, you know, a, a fair or a magazine like the Make magazine, what, what gets highlighted are beautiful products. Right. So you go to the Maker Fair, you see like a dragon, you know, spitting fire or this kind of crazy cars with, you know, all, all kinds of crazy inventions and say, oh, this is so cool and all of that. But if you go and you see, you know, a 12 year old with a project that's kind of half broken, half not working. You know, that is, oh, this is so lame, you know, it's not. However, that 12-year-old might be the, you know, might have learned a million things in the process of doing that project. It's not quite finished, not quite done, cannot, you know, spit fire or like jump over cars, whatever. 
but uh, so when you transport this kind of maker culture to schools, you have to be very uh, aware of the fact that for learning, for education, uh, the process is more important than the product. So if you, if you value too much the final product and how beautiful it is and how cool it is and all of that, you will, uh, uh, you know, the students who are not super proficient in the maker tools or all of those tools, they will feel like their work is not valued. And, and that has kind of devastating effects uh, as we've observed over and over. So uh, when you train your teachers to do the, those kinds of things, uh, y you know, you have to show them or ways to value the process. So how do you put your assessments all through the process so that when you give people you know, feedback or grades or whatever, or when you pick the one that's the best maker student, you don't just pick you know, the kids who are doing the best product because those might be the kids you know, whose parents are Google, Apple engineers or Infosys engineers much better than any other company. And, <laughs> and then they might just come, you know, they might bring that from home so they're not really learning at school. And just the last thing for now that I want to to comment on is this idea of, uh, you know, that I call like empower, empowerment before jobs. So in this kind of hands-on learning and STEM learning, there is a <laughs> lot of uh, conversation about, oh, these are the jobs of the future, and uh, which is fine. I mean, probably those are the jobs of the future. But when you talk to, uh, but you know, one, one interesting piece of data is that only about 4% of college graduates work in STEM fields, are needed in STEM fields. It's not like we need 50%, you know, 100 million engineers. So there is a caring capacity there, and no one really knows exactly what that caring capacity is. But the point is, uh, it, it should not be just telling kids, oh, there are jobs, you know, it's like in the graduate, uh, there are jobs in plastics, you know. Uh, in, in, if you know the movie, uh, there is a, uh, yeah, the graduate, there was this famous quote that, you know, one character tells Dustin Hoffman, oh, you should, you know, there are jobs in plastic. So, you know, there are jobs in STEM and CS and all of that. But when you talk to a 12-year-old, you should not be saying, hey, uh, there are jobs in whatever. In 10 years, you'll find a job in this. So, you know, just blindly study for the next 10 years. Uh, because that's not what kids care about when they are 10 or 12. You know, it should be about empowerment. It should be about you know, giving them expressive tools that they can find interesting and, and exciting things to do. Uh, it's, it's about having them participate in the world of technology as, you know, citizens and not just be consumers but producers and all of that. So th that's, I think, the third important thing is this idea that even though there is an important dimension of jobs and, you know, international you know, competition between countries and where the jobs and engineers and scientists going. But it should not be too much uh, in the, the daily activities we do in school. It should be more about expressiveness, about empowerment and all of that. So, uh, so those are like three things I wanted to start with. Thank you. Fantastic opening remarks. Thank you. I will. Okay, so I'm going to talk about exper experiential learning in terms of broadening participation. Um, so at Puerto Rico, just to give you an idea of the state of, uh, of computer science education, we do, last year we had two students that uh, attempted the AP exam, um, and we don't even know what schools they went to. One was Chinese, <laughs> we do know that. Um, but so. Um, most schools do not actually know schools that we know of unless they're magnet schools, like the school that we were um, working with through the university actually has a curriculum for even high school. Um, and there's nothing, it's a, it's a, so the way uh, the, the Department of Education works, it's very centralized. So changing curriculum is very hard because you have to go through the Department of Education and getting into the Department of Education is very hard. Um, and so most of what exists right now are after school clubs that people pay for. And of course, there's where we talk about computer science for all. What's happening is that our most well-off students and most educated students are getting the training and those students end up leaving the island. So we're left with a very void um, technology island. <laughs> 
um, or an island very void of technology with a very thriving or potentially thriving because what happens is a lot of those talented students come back and they want to start tech companies and then they basically end up in the computer science department we start training them and they start recruiting them so we have a big fallout of students that start getting learning computer science and start working for industry on the island those that finish go off and we actually have two in San Francisco with six-figure salaries <laughs> so um, we give them very very good training and um, the ones that stay behind are left earning less than 30,000 so you can see the disparity um, and so what we want to do is um, basically try we've we we joined between the computer science department and the Department of Education because what happens in the computer science department most of our students don't even know what computer science is they come into the computer science department because they want to become doctors and the requirement to get into computer science is lower than the requirement to get into biology um, and so then they within the first few weeks we basically start losing them to other after the first class we have a, v a huge drop in the number of people that continue in computer science because first of all they don't know what it is it's not really their focus and so one thing happened that really changed things is when Stanford <laughs> actually did the she plus plus videos a lot of our girls saw that and they got really motivated to create an include girls club and the Include Girls Club actually started promoting computer science. And we had this amazing increase in enrollment. We went from one class of 25 students in our department to four classes of 25. And then it started having about, in some of the classes, about 50% women. But the thing is, then industry started getting involved again, which is great. And industry saw we need to get K through 12 and so they started recruiting our students to focus on K through 12. And so right now, we have gone down in the university in terms of the number of students, women, uh, the women entering in the number of students. But K through 12 has a ton of activities for students, right? So there's a lot of maker spaces happening on the island. There's a lot of, um, a lot of um, CS training, you know, tech camps. The, there's, uh, there's one company that's doing really great you know, 10 week how to learn how to boot camps that are teaching people, but it doesn't really teach them computer science and it doesn't get them these jobs that a degree would, right? And so basically what we did with the computer science and education, we joined forces. We started trying to train teachers because the teachers are not leaving. They have family, they're established here. And they, if we train a teacher, we get to a lot more students and we really do the broadening participation. So we got some money from um, Google CS for HS and we created the first online class um, where we actually got over 30 volunteers to teach classes and show them how to integrate computational thinking into the curriculum so that we're actually going outside of that. Uh, basically trying to get activities and experiential learning into the classroom by teaching teachers how to do this and having the professors model that for them. And then we joined with the um, the, the, the um, Center for Excellent, Academic Excellence on our campus to give the people who, who finished um, a certificate. We had 15 people on Thursday before the Saturday that it started. We decided, okay, we've got to put out an ad because we had so little money, we couldn't do anything. Within one night, when we put this on the, the free public university, we had 115 yeah. teachers sign up. So the thirst is there. And basically, after we started doing that, from there, there was born a computer science teachers association led by professors. We just had the first scratch day yesterday, uh, last Sunday. And um, we also, could, we started looking or working with these broadening participation alliances. And the broadening partici participation alliance we first started looking, working with was Into the Loop because um, I had this relationship with Jane Margolis while I was in grad school. Her stuck in the shallow end basically got me through grad school. And so I basically said, can I come and can we take two people and do, because I saw what she, I went to 60 and I saw what, that she had a curriculum. So we were like, let's bring that curriculum. I saw the presentation, I said, let's bring this to Puerto Rico. So we did it in the first year and we tried it out at the university. And what ended up happening is that even the best professors from our university who are teaching at this place had difficulty with it being in English. Um, 
because their dominant language is Spanish. And so the, even, even though the curriculum is very, it's experiential, it still needed to be more culturally relevant. And so I'm gonna talk about cultural relevancy and then how, you know, it's not just translating the curriculum, which we found out also. Um, after that, we were invited into the Exploring Computing um, uh, Education Pathways of a broadening participation. And that has been wonderful because now we've learned how to work with industry and we're kind of like jump-starting this great thing so that now we have even, we've gotten people into the Department of Education through an NGO. He just had a, a meeting yesterday with the, the um, we've, we have, on the island have not been able to get a meeting with, with the, the, the Secretary of the Department of Education um, through our means, but he as an NGO coming from outside um, he's the leader of World Computer Exchange, was able to get a meeting, and we're collaborating with them. He actually um, led a, a, a charter school with experiential learning, and so we're trying to bring his organization that does recycling of computers, teaches uh, children to break them down and put them back together and sell low-cost computers, but we're trying to do it at the faculty level, because what we real, at the, I mean, teacher level. Because um, we realize that there's a, we have to build the self-efficacy of our teachers so that they feel confident. If they're, they basically feel intimidated by their own students who are learning more than what they do. So we're thinking about building a region or a center of these World Computer Exchange um, maker spaces or if you want to call them that, experiential learning centers um, that actually do recycling and provide low-cost computers so that the students also learn about entrepreneurial skills. Um, and the teachers, because the, the teachers are going to train the students. Um, and, and basically, um, through that, try to create collective impact, which we learned about by looking at another uh, broadening participation group from New York. That uh, Leanne came to talk to our teachers and our group, our, our government. Uh, explaining what they had done in New York and that motivated this idea of collective impact and having us work between industry, education, um, and uh, government on trying to tackle the problem and accelerate the process. Um, and so we just submitted a big grant to do a research practitioner partnership to examine the translation in seven schools um, of the ECS curriculum uh, at, the high, at the ninth grade level and we are partnering with the uh, the Department of Education to get the permission to offer that course in these schools, which has been, we hadn't been able to do that until we started doing all these, uh, working with Broadening Participation Alliances, and um, hopefully we'll have seven schools this year offering uh, Exploring Computer Science in Spanish. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. Well, these are excellent opening comments. Um, I see a couple of themes that I want to point out first, and I'll ask some questions. One of the things that I think is absolutely fascinating is that when you listen to all three of our speakers, the idea of relevance distinctly comes through in all their messages. Uh, Colleen talked about this whole issue of not just teaching subject matter, but showing how the subject matter is relevant to real problems that could be solved. And the idea of breadth. And breadth is interesting, right? Because what breadth does is it, it, it privileges the idea that there's something out there that you care about that relates to the lessons you're going to have. And breadth allows you to see that early rather than late in your educational experience. So relevance becomes a way of emotionally compelling the student to actually care about the lessons that you're providing. In the case of Paolo, I mean, he does a beautiful job of actually poo-pooing the same thing I poo-poo all day too, which is keychains. Like we can make more 3D printers and make more fobs. And in fact, what they aren't is relevant. And the idea that you want empowerment before jobs, that what you care about isn't simply the question of a career mentality but how you empower people, whatever career they go into, to see the relevance of that computer science lesson or that 3D printing architectural design process. Well, that means what you're doing is you're making the skills that they're attaining more relevant no matter what career they choose. So you're making schooling matter no matter what direction you go. In fact, a great investigative journalist today needs to be an outstanding computer scientist because they need to be able to go through big data and find the smoking guns that are hidden in there. And in the case of Patricia, by talking about this whole issue of cultural relevance, that the same lesson doesn't work in English if that's not their first language, even though they may be relatively fluent in English. We have to be relevant to the lived experiences of the students. And that means, I think that one size fits all, fits all is generally a failure, right? A, 
national website where you can download a key fob, a national curriculum that works only in English, or a national curriculum that teaches you the skills before teaching you what to do with those skills, in all cases will fail somewhere rather hard. So let me turn to some questions. Uh, happily, given that you all talked about relevance and about inclusion, actually, and I could do the same thing around inclusion. I think you all see the dots there, too. Um, let me start with you, Colleen. You know, I love this idea of exposing children to the potential of what their learning is for. And there's a microphone oh. for you. But I, I hear you talk about that, and my natural inclination is to say, yes, but everything you just said, I should use this in CS, but I should also use this in English and in history and in pretty much every other field of endeavor and discipline that I have in school. You know, is there something special about CS in that we need to, to show people the potential applicability of what they're learning across life? Or is this actually a general thing that's true of basically everything you're learning in college? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think um, I think there are things that are special about computer science. Um, it's not that computer scientists are the only people who think, because we say that a lot. We're like, oh, but computer scientists, science will teach people to think, and that uh, that's absurd. Um, <laughs> lots of people think. Um, maybe all people think. Um, Right? Um, but there are really interesting and unique things about computer science, and that is these terribly toxic stereotypes we have of computer scientists. And let's not lie, we share those with some other disciplines. You know, they, they have their toxic masculinity, white, uh, like, super genius geek gene narratives too. Uh, but I think computer science is, is relatively unique in the way it's portrayed in the media and the way our students believe it to be requiring a geek gene, believe that they do not belong. And we know how important belonging is to students' learning outcomes. Um, and so I think we're unique in, in being perceived as not welcoming and, and students as not belonging, which I think just heightens the relevance of uh, creating contexts that connect to students and their interests. The like, oh, should it be connected to all these other disciplines? Should they, should they be doing computing? Like, sure, but they've got like real things to teach. Do you know what I mean? So I'm like, oh, I could see how in your history class you also do computing, but like, you've been teaching history for a long time, and there's like important history things for people to learn. I think those are important, and people need to know those. So it's not obvious to me that like me throwing computer science in your history context is gonna make the learning of history better or more meaningful or more relevant for students. I don't know that I totally answered your questions, but I do want to throw out two more questions that I think we should be talking about. No, one's a comment. One is I think of like when I talk to ten, to Pablo's point, uh, when I talk to 10-year-old or 12-year-old kids who are poor, they are worried about jobs. So when I tell them like, "Oh no, you can like make a lot of money in this." They're like, "Oh, yeah? Cool." And like, yeah, it's a 10-year horizon, but I think like, you know, I grew, up, I grew up middle class and I grew up very slowly, but a lot of kids grow up very quickly and they need to be thinking about providing for their family. Okay, so that's my plug is like some kids, some kids that matters a lot. Um, and I think particularly <clears throat> like as like a middle class white woman, I'm like out of touch with that. Do you know what I mean? And so it's important for me to recognize when my students have uh, really different experiences than I do and, and attend have very different values than, than I like needed to have. Um, and I want us to talk about like making versus caring and doing and that sort of narrative and the ways in which making has become hyper masculinized and the ways in which like sewing isn't always seen as making and these like traditionally culturally feminine making tasks are not, are, are not in there. And I think it's just like fascinating, uh, that sort of piece of it. But. Ela, could I just interrupt you for a second? Uh, yes. Would you just let us know when you want to take questions from the audience, and I'll pass the mic if there's we any. We will. Okay. Yes, I'm going to. I think that was a hint. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> People's little hands are. I just want to let you know. Just let me know. Wave, and I have the mic. I'm going to do one more question for each of the remaining two speakers, and then we'll go right to you all. So keep your questions. We have a good 25 <laughs> minutes left, so we're going to have time. Paulo, uh, you talked about process before product, and you talked about empowerment before jobs, and empowerment is a heavy and powerful word. <laughs> My curiosity is, I heard process before product. It made me think of problem finding before process before product. That is to say, 
why are we making the thing we're making? And not just how we're going to go about making it, but how do we even figure out the questions we need to ask to know what is worth challenging ourselves with and what is worth making? And empowerment seems to me like it's much closer to that even earlier question. My question is sort of if you roll up your sleeves and really do this in a classroom, how do you do this? What, how do you invert this kind of power relationship that product has over us, the hegemonic structure it has, and talk instead about the problems in society that need solving? <coughs> so the, the gr gr great points. So I think one, um, uh, just kind of stepping back a tiny bit, uh, there's this uh, Alan Kay quote that you know I like. It's like if you want to, you know, travel to the future, uh, you just have to spend money, and you can. So if you think about how would space travel be? Well, if you spend like I don't know, fifty million dollars, you can actually now go to space. If you want to, you know, experience how you know the food of the future, I'm sure there is a chef somewhere who charges like you know ten thousand dollars and will show you some kind of you know amazing meal. So I mean, there there are lots of uh, high end activities in all human fields that are probably what we will experience in ten years, right? But if you have the money, you can. So the same applies to school. So if you go to the most expensive affluent schools. Uh, in the country or the world, uh, you know, some of them are extremely, you know, bad and conservative. So let's not talk about those. But there are some that are probably going to be, like, education of, you know, they, they're probably the schools of the future now. Maybe they don't have like, you know, all the kind of, you know, flying desks or like, I don't know, all the kind of Jetsons uh, kind of things. But uh, those they might represent on average what school, normal schools will look like in, in 10 years. So if you go to those schools, you don't see uh, kids, you know, um, sitting in rows and, you know, doing, being lectured at as much. You don't see them, uh, you know, doing this kind of video learning kind of thing. What you see is a lot of project-based learning, a lot of, you know, STEM uh, maker, CS, a lot of those things. Uh, you see a lot of teachers teaching, not computers replacing teachers, you know, kind of thing. So uh, uh, the point of this kind of uh, tangent is just to say that uh, we, we often do, uh, we, we often think that, you know, for um, those kids that can pay for, uh, as I think you were saying, you know, they, they get to experience educa education in a whole different way. They do projects, they have, you know, they learn how to program, they learn how to, uh, as you're saying, like, they are empowered because they go through lots and lots of experiences where, uh, in which they can find their own intellectual passions, they can exercise them, they can get better, they can learn how to work collaboratively and, and all of that. So, <laughs> You know, that's sort of what I call the, the pedagogy divide. So we are, we have a, a group of kids that are experiencing education of the future, that are ed experiencing education that is empowering, that will make them leaders and all of that. And in our public schools, we are like, well, you know, we should do the basics because, you know, we, we, we don't have resources to do all this stuff. So uh, I, I think what's happening is that, um, we, we, we should make uh, public schools, uh, you know, the most interesting, engaging places because that's where kids ne need the most uh, kind of motivation. That's where they need a motivation boost. That's where they need to fall in love with culture, with knowledge and all of that. And instead, we're doing the opposite. So public schools, they have, for the most part, the basics and, uh, you know, the kind of more normal disciplines with normal teaching uh, uh, techniques. And in the more affluent schools, then they do projects, they do maker, they do all, all kinds of things. So, um, you know, in terms of what you're saying about empowerment, uh, we need to kind of invert this kind of mindset and think that uh, those new ways of teaching and learning, they should not be kind of curiosities that, you know, affluent uh, schools need to uh, get you experience and affluent kids need to uh, get you experience. But they need to be part of the DNA of normal schooling because, uh, you know, we're talking about jobs and uh, in 10 or 12 years, 
but all kinds of important human activities in 10 or 12 years, they will derive from those kinds of activities that now we're only yeah, giving to a few kids. Yeah. So, and I'll go back to some other things afterward. But okay, thank you. And one final question, Patricia. Uh, well, exactly what Paulo started saying. I mean, he's talking about changing schooling. I was really excited when you talked about professional development and collective impact. So I'm curious uh, how far you think this can go. You know, this uh, scaling is always a big question. Can we change education in a scalable way to make it experiential, but for many children, not just for a few in a pilot school? Um, do you think professional development is the approach to that, empowering teachers the way you're describing? I do, but I think you have to have research associated with those developments because you have to observe what's happening in each of the communities that you're trying to impact um, and have maybe like a test case the first time. And once you do that first test case, uh, learn from that experience and then, uh, then scale it because scaling it without that research, um, I think um, could do more harm than good. It could discourage a lot of people. It could discourage the faculty. Uh, and that's what we found with um, our, I was really happy that we did it um, with it within our university. You know, I really, I wanted to scale really big at first and everybody was saying, no, 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 from education was telling me no. So from the computer science point, I was like, oh, we can make this really huge, it'll be great. <laughs> we can just like make a MOOC and, and they were all like, no. And this is, I think, actually the really important thing about collaborating with other people with education. Um, the different stakeholders give very different perspectives. Um, and, and it's great. Um, and so this is where the whole collective impact comes in. We, you really do need a group of stakeholders from different perspectives um, to make a difference. So for example, even though I, I ragged on industry at the beginning of my talk, <laughs> because it seemed like they were taking all of our students, they had the same problem we do, right? The lack of talent. And so they actually funded, we started creating this, this collaboration with them and they funded a CS for All summit on our campus and uh, on our um, on the island where we could bring everyone who is doing computer science education. They paid for Leanne to come <laughs> um, from the CS uh, New York initiative, and so having these co doing collaborative impact is is crucial. I, I just can't emphasize it enough because now they you know while we were doing the CS for All summit, we could say to them, hey, we have this issue that you're taking our students <laughs> before they graduate. And they said to us, we have an issue that your curriculum isn't sufficiently relevant for the industry that we're trying to create. And, and so through these, through these collaborations, I think a lot can happen. And this is also, I think this is one thing that's very interesting, like I said before, the correct, having not just local, but outside collaborations. So like, you know, working with Exploring for Computer um, education pathways, they have given us a lot of direction in terms of how to approach, um, how to approach industry, how to approach government. And then through that collaboration, we hear what's happening in all the other states, and we get ideas from them. And, and, and this, is, this is, 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 is crucial. And like I mentioned with uh, World Computer Exchange, we have been trying on the island to have this meeting. We couldn't get it. He was able to get it, but through our collaboration, he was able to present our idea and it looks like it's now gonna happen, which is phenomenal. <laughs> and we've been trying for years. Well, not, yeah, probably like a year to get it. And, and he, through other means, was able to, to get it as an outsider, which is, I think, more, more, um, more of a, a, a proof that you really need to do this collab these collective, uh, collective impact and have all the stakeholders working on the same issues and agreeing on what the issues are and then you know, brainstorming on them before you tackle them. Thank you, I love that you're about industry in. Okay, thank you for your patience. We need some hands to go up now. Whitney has the microphone. Just make sure you talk into the mic so it goes on the video. Thanks, um, I, um, I'm Nigam Mansri, they're from Cleveland State uh, University. So I, I wanna go back to this jobs point that Colleen, you mentioned, um, and, uh, and the fact that it is important for some kinds of kids to think about jobs, and to put it back in the context of experiential learning, um, it, so we, we've, we, we, we should be worried that when we talk about jobs, we are immediately hyper-focused on software development jobs. It shouldn't be, right? I mean, at that level, especially when you're talking about 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds, um, and, and if, if we want to talk about the computer science for all um, part, right, then we should be featuring jobs in other fields that involve um, a, a, a knowledge of computing, right? So, so as we think about experiential learning, 
rather than simply going to the tech sector, the maker movement and saying, show us what jobs you have, we should be going to the clothing industry, we should be going to the, um, you know, the, the advertising industry, whatever else, and saying, you know, or, or manufacturing. I mean, bring those kinds of jobs and feature what um, those 10 and 12 year olds can do with a, 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 a bit of knowledge in, 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 uh, in computer science. I think that's one piece that, uh, that I think we as a community should be thinking about. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, applications for some of the skills that we're teaching students, and I think there's sometimes a gap between how are the skills that we're teaching them, say in Scratch, relating to using spreadsheet applications in powerful ways in most jobs. Um, and I, I think that we still have some bridges to build there to help students see that relevance and connection and that this is not about software engineering jobs. Just one, one quick thing, I mean, I, I, I agree, and I think one of the most powerful aspects of computing is how it has transformed every job around. I mean, you mentioned journalists, right? But you know, if you look at lawyers, uh, economists, uh, you know, ev everywhere, digital technologies, just like writing in you know, hundreds of years or thousands of years ago, has transformed every cognitive task you do. Uh, computation has that power to, to transform all kinds of things. And you know, even though I, I agree that jobs are important uh, in a certain context, but we also don't know what jobs will be there in, in 10 years. Maybe software development will be eaten by AI or something, and maybe there will be other jobs. But I think the other thing is, you know, th there is a, a possible future where there will be no, n not enough jobs for everyone uh, because of automation and AI. And then what will people do, right? I mean, I mean, not not thinking about the economic part of this, but I mean, our our utopian, you know, future has been always we'll do more art, we'll do more like you know interesting things with our time instead of working, you know, routine jobs. So there is that aspect of our future lives that you know, computation is an important part. Maybe we'll dedicate our time to, instead of, you know, jobs as we know them now, something very different that will require lots of skills and knowledge that uh, are not those kinds of time-limited, uh, you know, skills and, uh, that we're, we're learning in lots of places. I want to throw a statistic and a warning into your question, and then Leanne. Statistic, something we can't forget. If you look at STEM jobs in America, the race wage gap disparity and the gender wage gap dis disparity are just as bad as other fields in the US. That is to say, getting an education in computer science or getting an education in STEM has not made our society more equitable, and that's on us, and we have to think about that. Second thing, quick warning for you, I work a great deal in West Virginia. In West Virginia, the parents don't let the children take the computer science programming class precisely because they're afraid that those children will leave once they have that computer science training. And so quite literally, we have to educate the parents on why computer science can be a skill that's valuable even if they stay in West Virginia with their family, where family is priority. So we have an educational challenge in the most underserved parts of Appalachia across that part of the US that makes it hard to even make progress there. Well, so I wanted to add that too, because in Puerto Rico, you take, you take, you give them computer science and they leave, right? And so um, this idea of introducing compu uh, computational thinking into all the disciplines um, is uh, something because we have a strong manufacturing uh, industry in, in in Puerto Rico and a strong pharmaceutical <laughs> industry, um, and so this is why you know going through the biology and going through the chemistry is very strong. But if we can show them that you know, computational science can be a career that they can do in Puerto Rico. That's, that's really important. <laughs> Thanks, hi, my name's Leanne Delizer. I'm from CSNYC uh, and also the CS for All Consortium. And I think, you know, to continue almost on this vein, uh, we have to be careful about our own expert blind spots. Uh, we understand that computing pervades every field and I think if we're talking about computer science as a literacy for all children, I had this amazing conversation with a faculty member from Harvey Mudd, um, Zachary Dodds, and we were having the zero sum argument, right? Schools already have a very full day. What are you going to take out to put computer science in? Um, and Zach, I think kind of flippantly said, who needs geology anymore? 
And I turned to him and I said, because we live on a rock. <laughs> right? Every kid learns geology because we live on a rock. Every kid learns basic biology so you can communicate with your doctor as a part of your life. We are living in a society where we need to communicate about the technology that it lives in our pockets, in our cars, in our daily devices, in the, the machines we use to communicate with our family and our friends. And so computer science for all is not only a movement about being able to join the computational workforce, but to be a computational citizen because we live in a computational world. And I think that that's also part of the conversation is if you have these skills, you will be competitive with your peers for whatever job you want. And just like every community has a doctor and every community has a lawyer, eventually every computer community is going to need computational professionals because your mom and pop startup shop will need a website. The restaurant down the street will need a website that has their menu at it so that when I find it on Yelp, I know what I can eat there, right? And so there are lots of ways that those computational skills are needed in our home communities. And we do ourselves a disservice when we talk about the Google and the Facebook as the major employers, because they're not. The major employers are actually the small, little, tiny pieces. We're growing up as a discipline in computer science. And we don't always want to pay $100,000, $500,000 a year to someone to fix the text on our website. And we need those kids too. We have time for one more question. I want to, I want to bring up something which is, I guess, speaking not on the job side, but I'm thinking of administrators and trying to get this into actually our schools. You're then talking to educators, and I think we risk when we keep bringing up the job argument. I don't know, and I'm a teacher. I don't think I'm teaching my middle schoolers, which is what I teach, for the jobs. I'm teaching them how to learn. And I think teaching computers is how to learn. And this goes back to what you know Seymour Pepper has said. It's got, it's got more about learning. I can see, because I've taught math and I've taught computer science, and I've seen how much my students actually understand what a variable is when they start to code, for example. So I think, I don't know whether at some point if we're ever gonna get this really to all people, we have to bring it to these administrators, to our district boards where we are standing up and arguing. And if I put up a slide about, look at how many jobs they are. I don't know, I think a lot of our administrators just kind of hang on, this is not we're here, what we're here for. And so do the teachers. So I think, I don't know, at some point, I'm, I'm going to try to, I guess not a question, I'm just <laughs> giving my comment, but I want you to address, like, how do we shift the story so our administrators and our boards and our, you know, they start buying in? So I think we'll need a whole session to answer that. Unfortunately, <laughs> we only have a couple of minutes left, so let me get... Uh, one answer from one Colleen, sentence, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our other two speakers to do something a little unusual, which is while she's talking, think of one take-home message, something you want to say to the audience that you hope they share with one colleague after this conference. Oh gosh, it's not about jobs. I just mean that some, you know, we you gave the counter example of students aren't worried about jobs, so we can't motivate them with jobs, and I was like, oh no, like, I thought that, but I think some students are motivated by jobs, but like, like, oh my goodness, I need to teach people computer science to help capitalism. I'm not like on board. Do you know what I mean? But like, and so I feel like, oh, I've been like playing the pro job angle, which is not my normal seat. <laughs> but it's like, I wanna, uh, I wanna play the, emp uh, yeah, it's too late. It's too late. But I wanna play the, the empathy for, <laughs> the empathy for students' interests and goals. And so if they care about jobs, I care about jobs. Do I care about jobs? By myself? Nope. <laughs> but <laughs> so yes, I think I think we talked a lot about jobs, but but for a strange <laughs> reason. But for a strange reason, I think everybody's on the empathy yeah. Yeah. for jobs side of this. Yeah. Okay. Well, Good luck with the take-home <laughs> messages, folks. Okay. So uh, my take-home message is that. I think you know, all the activities around hands-on learning and maker and computer science and all of that, those should be new entry points for kids into you know, the world of learning and, and, and 
culture and all of that, because right now there is just one way of being successful in school, which is sitting down and memorizing and, and all of that. And I think those need to be a new and socially accepted entry point into schools and, and culture, because as you might know, there are millions of kids that are not good at traditional schooling, but once you give them a new entry point, a new way to be successful, they, are, they do amazing things. And year after year, we're losing those kids just because we offer one way of being successful in school. So I think offering multiple ways to be success successful in schools is great. And all the buzz and uh, you know uh, around maker education and hands-on, that's a, a fantastic once in a generation opportunity for us to, to make it that happen. Thank you. Patricia. So I, I think my, my my message is going to focus around um, that the future of computer science is interdisciplinary. And uh, I think one of the things that we could do, and, and you know, starting in Puerto Rico that is completely barren and you can like do whatever you want. And we had this, um, you know, doing this integrating computational thinking into your curriculum, no matter what it was, because there's no computer science, um, gave me this really, it made me see the hunger of all teachers, whether they're from history, English, uh, or science, math, uh, I mean, we had librarians there. <laughs> all people in education would like to learn a little bit more about computation and be, uh, you know, um, digitally literate. Um, and I think if we do that, to, if we can help the teachers to do that, that will translate to the students. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.